All right, uh, here's uh, we, we've already got some lines uh, stacking up, so at some point here soon we need to go to the phones. Four five eight talk. I got I got one more thing on the Constitution. Um, I like I don't disagree with Frank at all. I think I think the Constitution would be a great thing to get back to. But uh, I I propose going much further than that. And there was a post there was a post on the Lou Rockwell blog uh, where this guy was talking about the Constitutional Convention. And he says after the Constitutional Convention, the states could have gone either way, for or against adoption. George Washington, who could not tell a lie, said in a letter to Madison that the multitudes often judge from externals, the appearance of uh, unanimity. Uh, He said that was very important. Of course, the Philadelphia Convention did not have unanimous consent. Only 39 of the 55 delegates signed it. But each state legislator, each legislature was sent a copy of the proposed constitution along with a resolve and a cover letter from George Washington, the most trusted person in America, that claimed that they had uh, resolved unanimously to support it. And Washington explained to Madison that this apparent unanimity will have its effect. And indeed, uh, it did, because all of the states ended up ratifying, because they, because Washington had told them, oh, there's unanimous consent, even though it was only like two-thirds of the delegates actually mm-hmm. supported it. Sounds like the income tax. Well, it also... Right, it right al- from day one. It also goes back to the issue of, are you going to stand with your neighbors, or are you going to turn on your neighbors? You know, I, here's my personal story. We, uh, we circumcised our, our newborn this week. Uh, and no, we did it under the doctor's supervision. Doctor oh, okay. was there and everything there. Uh, I didn't just pull out the, the garden shears or something. I mean, we, we went to a, a clinic and everything. Uh, here's the deal. In order to go through the process of seeing the doctor, we had to fill out these forms that included some what I would consider very intrusive questions about our home life, uh, asking, you know, how many people lived in the home, what kind of animals we might have in the home, uh, how our, how the relationship between the mother and the father was whether it was a healthy relationship, things like that. And one of the questions that just absolutely set me off, are there any firearms in the o- in the home? And I wrote right on the questionnaire, what does that matter? And then after a few, I know my wife's like, honey, calm down. It's all right. It's, a, it's, just a, it's just a stupid questionnaire. And then I went back and I wrote in there, just in case you're wondering, I also have scissors. Uh, I, I mean, I, I really, I don't get why they're asking that unless it's part of an an anti-gun agenda. Well, down in Florida, they had a similar mandate where people had to tell the doctor that. The state legislature moved in and said, no, you may not ask about guns in the home. Round of applause. Yay. Very, very good legislation, I think, telling them, no, you cannot pry about a person's Second Amendment right. That was just tossed out on Friday. What was it? On Wednesday? by a judge as being unconstitutional because it interferes with the doctor's First Amendment right. The, uh. So apparently, uh, some rights trump others, as as far as a judge is concerned here. The the right of a doctor to pry into whether or not you have, you know, basically to invade your privacy, which that violates the Fourth Amendment. Yeah, but is that the doctor who came up with the form? Is it like, I you know... I don't believe it was the doctor. It was the government form. It's a state form, form exactly. right? No, actually, it's a federal thing. Okay, right. So, but it's not the doctor's form. It's not like, you know... Exactly. My medical consulting agency wants to know this. So, uh, that's a red herring then. Yeah, and... I mean, it's it's trying, to, right, it's trying to show that, oh, see, rights do conflict. But it's not your rights and the doctor's rights. It's you versus the state. Again. And the simple solution to that is go to a different doctor. Well, if right, if if that were the case, if it were indeed the doctor's private form and right. he wouldn't, you know, do whatever, then you go to a different doctor. Why would you want a, a doctor, you know, working on your kid who doesn't, who thinks you should be in jail anyway? And actually, that's a good, as far as the legislature is concerned, would be probably the a good um, story of what we actually believe is the only, if there is, legitimate cause for government. To protect someone's rights. That's the only reason they're there. In fact, James Madison, who was a whack job that we just said that uh, <laughs> George Washington was writing to, and as far as uh, what I believe about the Constitution, I probably fall with Patrick Henry. I like that guy. I like his thoughts on it. Madison said the only reason to have government is to protect people's property. He actually, that's the only reason. He said that is the end of government, to protect property. He said that's the end of good government. Of just government. So that's the only 
here's the guys that found it. Here's the guys that adopted, whether they adopted it or not, two-thirds, roundabout, whatever. The fact of the matter is the guys that gave us this country, I mean, we like to thank our soldiers now, the World War II vets, our vets. Go back 200 and some years ago, the guys that gave everything they had to the cause, these were rich people. I mean, Washington had like $500,000 in today's standards. They gave and lost every bit of wealth they had. They gave up their status in society. They gave up everything. And they said, here is your country, or here is what we're giving you, and here is what we believe it should be. So if he says the only reason for government is to protect property, then why do we have it doing other things? And why do people now say, well, no, that's not the only reason for just government? Well, the guys that founded the country said it was. Well, well we, we, we all know have, the borough owns, pro- owns everybody's property. We can't right? have juries uh, saying that laws are wrong and nullif- nullifying laws. Really? Well, the people that started this country said that you should. Yeah, that's it's funny, too, because the um, so-called progressives are, are big opposers of uh, jury nullification, but that's how slavery was effectively abolished. Uh, the abolitionist movement in this country started from the jury box because the abolitionists realized that none of the politicians, um, liberal or conservative, and those terms mean opposite things back then, but none of the political parties wanted to end slavery because they all had a political... Um, incentive to keep it. And so they started nullifying the law from the jury box. And it was that pressure that actually caused slavery to come to an end. It had nothing to do with the Civil War or anything else. So it's, of- it's funny because because the big changes in the big moral steps forward have come through nullification of laws, not through addition of laws, even even when viewed from a you know a progressive view of history or whatever you want to call it. You know, one of the things I've advocated for quite often is that we elect people to Juno or to the borough or to any level of government that that make it their promise not to pass any new laws, but to go in and simply remove old laws. However, it's really not even the red the legislature's duty to remove bad law. It's the jury. Yeah. All right, gentlemen. Well, we, I want to say one last thing with the jury nullification. Um, David just said something about progressives. Um, unions, for the most part, um, you can kind of see who they support here and there. And they're usually progressive minded, minded people that they support. Well, the things that we advocate for, jury, jury nullification, Unions wouldn't be around if it wasn't for jury nullification. The right to um, strike. Years ago, when people were striking, the government said, you can't do that. The jury threw it out said, yes, they can strike. Jury nullification works for everyone, not just those wackos that believe in liberty. It works for everyone. No, Josh, it only worked in 1215. <laughs> oh. Before no, the you're, jury. You know, you're, you're referring to the Magna Carta? <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's that crap? All right, 458-TALK is the number. Are you still there, caller? Hi, this is Randy. Good morning, Randy. Hi there. I wanted to get the opinion from Josh and Aaron and David about an uh, uh, issue that I brought up to you yesterday, Steve, on the radio, the uh, Fair Employment Act of 2011, which, uh, right according to the verbiage, it says, to amend the Civil Rights Act of 1964 to prohibit discrimination on the basis of unemployment status. In other words, you cannot discriminate against people that are unemployed. And uh, President uh, Obama has placed this measure in his American Jobs Act and just wanted to know what uh, Josh and Aaron and Dave think about it. I'll take that. I actually, strangely enough, am a candidate that actually owns a business. And I hire people. We have close to 40 people now. Um, The government does not have the right to tell me who I can and cannot hire based on discriminate this, discriminate. I hire people that I need. I have good people. I do discriminate in the sense that if someone comes to me and says, I want a driving job, and I say, okay, what are your qualifications? Well, I've never driven a truck before. In fact, I can't even drive a car. I'm completely illiterate, but I'm also unemployed. Well, sorry. I'm going to have to discriminate against you because I cannot hire you to do this job if you know nothing about it. 
there is, whether we like to think of it or not, unfortunately, there is discrimination in everything that we do. When I go out to eat, I discriminate where I want to go eat because I do not like this place. The food stinks. I love this place, so that's where I go. Well, I, therefore, I discriminated against the place that I didn't like. Um, as far as discriminating just because someone's... You know, I don't discriminate against someone because they're black. I don't discriminate against someone just because they believe differently. Obviously, we don't. Randy calls in, and we never cut him off. Hey, what about But if they are a Jew? I am definitely against anything the government comes in and tells. I mean, with the tell someone you must do this, you must do that. Your business must do this. Your business must do that. I mean, business is what gets money. I don't understand why the government can never understand this, why the borough doesn't understand this. They make things so hard for business to come here and do business. Well, businesses are what pro provides employment, which makes money, which makes people can have homes and property that the borough gets to tax. But instead, they go the opposite route and push business out. Well said, Joshua, and I really appreciate that. Thank you, Randy, for the call. 458-TALK is the number. Good morning,